Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity tutorial. So this video will be the first of many where I'm going to be covering different multiplayer topics using Mirror. I'll be explaining in the first part of the video why I'm using Mirror over Photon and what Mirror is and how it works. That's what this video is mainly going to be. It's going to be how to set up Mirror and explaining from a sample project they've got where you can host a server and connect to play a game of Pong. I'll be explaining the code behind it and how it all works. Keep in mind this won't be a series, even though there's going to be lots of different videos using this, apart from episode 1, you don't have to watch any of the others in order. This video is about the setup and explanation overview, but then all the other videos will be standalone, because I know on YouTube people prefer standalone videos as opposed to, you know, me doing a series. So let me know how you're liking the videos in the comments of each of the videos. Um, but yeah, let's jump into the video. So I split this video up into three steps. Step 1 will be installing Mirror through Unity, through the Asset Store. Step two will be actually looking at a sample project and you know if you want you can go and look at all the other sample projects in your own time. And then after we've looked at the sample project and had a little play around with it, for step three we'll actually be looking into the code and I'll be explaining how it all works. Let's get into it. Okay so step one, what is Mirror and why are we using it? Well I want to keep this part quite short because you guys can go and do reading about it, but I did a poll on my channel and a lot more people, a huge majority, wanted Mirror, so that's one uh, reason. Another reason is because there's no user limits, so you don't have to worry about, you know, paying Photon because you want more stuff. Mirror is completely free, you just download it, you can download it off GitHub, or you can download it on the Unity Asset Store, which is the way we're going to do it. Um, you can go look through the code, you can debug into their code, you can make modifications to it if you need to. Um, if you have any bug fixes, you can obviously submit it to them on here, you can talk about it in their Discord server. There's pretty good documentation for it, there's good starter projects and guides. Everything I found about it is really good. And the reason how I picked it up so fast in the last few days is because it's pretty much identical to the old Unity multiplayer system because it's built on top of it. They actually took the old multiplayer system, they fixed loads of bugs, they've added new features, and they've just made it a lot better. And they're constantly making it a lot better too. So I hope you guys agree with my choice there. And just let me know down below how you're finding the videos. One of the other benefits is that it's client server. So we're actually going to have uh, code that is running on the server and code that is running on clients. And the server can be hosted by an actual person when they uh, run the game. So when you build the game and you can make maybe make a host button, when you press the host button, you actually run a server and a client. And then when your friends try and connect to you, they connect through your IP. Just like as if you were playing a Minecraft server, you put in their IP address, then you connect to that. And then eventually, if you want to have dedicated servers, you can also do that too. But for now, we're not going to worry about dedicated servers and all that lot because that's a bit more complicated. But doing your own hosting is super easy. And we're going to be looking into this video with a sample project. Then in the next few videos, we'll be setting up our own custom network managers, you know, making some of our little simple things like spawning in players and whatever. But yeah, let's get into this video. Okay, so over in Unity, I've made a blank project, so just go ahead and make a blank project. When GitHub is back up, because as of making this video, it's down right now, they're having some problems. When it's up, I'll be creating a repository for this so you guys can go download it. And um, But when I do that, I'll be ignoring the mirror folders that we will get, we'll get in a second, because there's no need for me to have them on GitHub when you can just get them from the asset store yourself. So you make a blank project, okay, go to the asset store and just search mirror. And once you've searched mirror, you want to go ahead and download and then import it into your project. All right, I'm sure you guys can press that and do that. Once it's in your project, you'll have a mirror and a script templates folder. We'll ignore script templates. That's just like, you know, when you right click and create a new C sharp script and then it's a new behavior script and it's got a template, it's got like the start and the update. That's just some more templates for doing other things, but we'll ignore that for now. We want to go over to mirror and we have the runtime, which is some of the stuff to do with the actual um, framework. But if we look in examples, we've got these different examples and we've got one about chat, one about um, Pong, room, tanks. We're going to go for Pong and we'll go to the Pong scene. OK, so here's the Pong scene. If we go to game, you see here's the Pong. And before we look into the code, we're going to have a little go with it and I'll show you how to make a server and connect to it. And then we'll actually look into the code. So to do this, to actually play and test with yourself, you need to go file, build settings and add this scene as your initial build scene. Um, you can remove the default one for now. So this is our game, okay? And then we're just gonna say build, and I'm gonna make a builds folder. So let's call it builds, okay? And then in there, I'll just click select, and that's gonna go build the game. So I'll see you guys when it's done. Okay, so it's finished building. I am now running the game over in Unity, so I'm gonna maximize it. And you'll notice up here we have three buttons. We have LAN host, LAN client, and LAN server. Okay, so, um, 
notice how this says localhost. So localhost, if you've ever played Minecraft, for example, you can type this in and it actually is just a way of saying your own IP. So because I'm playing on the same network as myself, I can actually do that. Um, now, this won't do anything if I just click it by default because it's trying to connect, but there is no... I'm not hosting anything on my computer, so it kicks me off, okay? It failed to connect. If I click LAN server only, then this will run as a server and I can connect to the server. So if I go over to my built version, which is full screen, I should have made it windowed, but anyway, I can now LAN client and I'm a client on the server. Okay, I can play, I can move up and down for Pong. And if you actually look over on the server, you see me there, but I can't play because this is just the server. Okay, let's stop the server. You notice back over here, I've been kicked. Now, if I click LAN host, this means I have to also allow access for people to join to me because um, this is a new application. So it's asking for permission. I am now hosting on this machine, okay? So that means I am a server and a client, right? I am the server and I'm playing as a client. Let's move my pedal up here. And I go back over to Unity. I can now join as a client. And now I've got two clients in here, okay? Uh, the game, like the example game doesn't actually have um, scoring or anything, you can't win or lose. The point is I can now move on this instance and on the other instance, you'll actually see it too. So if I hit, I have to obviously click over, but you see how the game continues over here. I can hit the ball back and then I could obviously like Hit it, tab out, hit it. This will be very hard to actually play. I'm, I'm just that skilled. Oh, shit. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so what we've got is we've got a Pong game where this built version is the server and the client. And then we've got the one in the editor, which is currently just a client that's connected. If I leave on this client, the actual server just gets rid of the ball, gets rid of my player, and it just leaves me as myself and I can stop too. Okay, so it's that easy to actually just make a server and actually join to it. It's super easy, okay? Now we're actually going to go look into the code. Okay, so if we look in the scene, we're going to go through each object and explain how it works. So ignoring the camera, we have the network manager. So this is the main thing. This is the entry point for your application. So the network manager, Pong. Okay, this is a custom version they've made for the Pong game. So it just overrides the built-in version. Now it's got lots of things here. We'll quickly go through. Um, obviously, you're not going to use most of these things. Oh, sorry, no, you'll use most, but you're not going to use all of the things. So don't destroy and load simply means when we go to a new scene, this thing still exists. That's what we want. Running background, so if you tab off this or something, you know, you still want the server to keep running. Start on headless means that um, this will start running. So a headless server is where you don't have any graphical user interface. So if you're just hosting it on like a remote thing and there's no UI, you know, just ignore that. They won't really matter for what you're doing, most likely. The server tick rate. Um, yeah, so if you're playing, as it says here, like a top level, a high end FPS where it's super important to get everything perfect, then go for 60. But otherwise, uh 30 is good for any like you know games where it's not about complete precise you know you don't have to be perfect if you're playing a game at 60 fps but you update data over the network half of that time so every two frames instead of every one frame effectively is what it's doing um then you'll be just fine debug messages is up to you um when you come online so when you connect to the network manager or when you disconnect so you might you know lose internet connection or something you can give it a scene to go to so yeah you might have like a menu scene you would drag in there that's that's the scene i want to go to if i'm in the middle of a game and i lose connection just go back to the menu um network info so this is just telling it which transport layer to use you can actually get different ones the default one is called telepathy i'm not going to be getting into all that the network address is when you call there's a connect function, when you say connect, it uses this address. So you could type in your IP address. This is just the default value it uses when you um, press play, but you actually need to change the network manager dot network address when you're trying to connect to someone's server. Uh, max connections is four. So obviously it just automatically stops more than four people joining. Um, authentication, currently none, but you can add uh, username and password authentication and stuff. There's different authenticators you can use. The player prefab is simply the thing that spawned for you when you join. Uh, and this uh, boolean just says whether you should create the player's object when they spawn or not. Round robin, uh, so you can have different spawn points and this is basically telling it, you know, should I pick a random spawn point or should I go in order like looping through them and then going back to the start if you have different spawn points. Uh, and then here it says, here's the place for the left racket spawn. Here's the place for the right racket spawn. So you actually see in the game, if we go to 2D mode, do this, zoom out press W. Okay, so that's the left racket spawn, that's the right racket spawn. They're just empty transforms telling the network manager where to spawn in the player. And then here's a spawnable prefab, ball. So anything you need to instantiate at runtime needs to be added here. You can either add it manually in the build like this if you've got a few items, but if you have loads, you can write a script to 
um, actually load it in automatically. So you might have a folder in your project, the resources folder. You chuck everything in there and you can just tell it to loop over the resource folder and load them all up into here, okay? But to spawn something in on the network to appear on other people's clients, you need to have in the spawnables list, okay? For this game, it's just a ball. So just one, just drag it in, it's, it's fine, right? And then this is when I press play, you notice how there's a hood at the top left. Just to have this host and stuff, you can turn that on and off. You can uh, just remove it if you want. In in an actual game, you'll have a menu to handle these buttons, but for now, they just do a little uh, GUI draw thing to make life easier. And then this is the port it's hosted on and the Mac server size. Just some things you can set. This is all just random data. Well, not random data, sorry. It's all just data for you to set. Now, this is all on the network manager, but they've got the network manager Pong, which adds these extra free, right? The ball, the rackets, okay? And this version that they've done overrides different methods so it tells you here if you mouse over they've got really good documentation um it tells you whether a function is called on the server or on the client because keep in mind this is one code base for server and client so this is only called on the server and it's when a client is added okay so when a client connects that means they've connected to your network but once they've been connected they then need to be what's called like added right as it says here it's added with um, client.add player and that's what actually like will then spawn in the paddle for the player so you can actually go look at the code for this if you want right if we go to the override you see here what normally happens when a, a player is added well we say go grab a start position so it basically figures out what it is right they've written a method to oops they've written a method to find your start location um, okay get a start location and then basically if the start position exists then um, use this position otherwise just spawn it in in the center but that's just kind of like an error that's just in case there is a problem then just spawn it somewhere else and then add player for connection is a way of saying take this this player and tie it to this connection to this connection so by doing this it basically says the player is now owned by this connection okay so i now own this paddle um when i join okay and then that's the base implementation but they actually don't call that here they, instead of doing that they actually use this logic instead so they say, well, if the number of players is zero, use the left spawn point. Or if the number of players is not zero, then use the right spawn point. Okay, so they get the start location. They say spawn it in at that place and then add it themselves. And then as well as doing that, they also say if the players is now two. So if there's like, you know, if you've joined and the game's now full, then spawn in the ball prefab. Okay, now that spawns it in on the server and then network uh, spawn, as it says here, spawns it in on all the clients. Okay. So you spawn it on the server, then you tell the clients to spawn that game object, which will keep it synced between them, okay? Um, you can add components to sync, like, the position, uh, the animation, and then you can write your own, right, to sync other stuff. And then they've also overridden one of the other functions, called on the server only when someone disconnects, okay? When someone disconnects, then that means there is no longer two people, so the ball lets destroy it, and by calling network server.destroy, it gets destroyed on everyone, okay? And then do the base logic, and the base logic is to um, get rid of their connection. So get rid of any connected object, right? So this actually gets rid of their paddle, okay? So over here it says destroy the ball and then go find that person's connection and destroy their paddle and then log it, okay? If, they sh if they're logging debug messages, then log the debug message. Okay, and that's all they've done. Then everything else is in the network manager already. You can override a lot of things. You can add custom logic for when, you know, there's so many here, when a client changes scene. Uh, well, obviously this is, called on the client so if it says on client it's basically telling you it's called on the client if it says on server it's called on the server so it says on the server when a client is ready on the server when a network error occurs for a client on the server connect called on the server when a new client connects and you can do so many things with this um but for the pong example they only do these two things okay that's the network manager then they've got the ball so the ball is a network behavior you need to inherit from network behavior, which by the way, inherits from mono behavior, if this object is synced over the network, okay? And the ball stores its speed and the rigid body. And then it sim simply says, I mean, I don't know why they don't just set these things. Um, oh no, obviously you can't set it in the spec to what I'm on about, yeah. So when the, this is called, okay, when they become active on the server. So what that means is this code is only ran on the server, okay? Only on the server, um, as it says here, only simulate it uh on the server but that, what that means is simulated is normally false but because this gets called on the server we're going to set it to true 
So the ball is only simulating physics on the server, and we're going to give it an initial velocity to the right just to just to start the game playing. Okay. Then they've got some math here to calculate um, the velocity based on the player. Say okay. And all this time, the way it syncs position with the player is if we go back to Pong Prefab's ball, they've got on here as well as the rigid body and stuff. They've also got a network transform, which, as you see here, client authority says set to true if the movement is coming from the client, otherwise false if it's coming from the server. Now the physics is being simulated on the server, so it's false, okay? We're saying, no, the client can't move this object, it is being moved by the server and the client is receiving the position, basically, okay? And just by having that synced on here, um, because the ball, because it has a network identity, if I try and move this, I think what will happen is, yep, I can't remove it because the other thing relies on it. You need to have a network identity to have a network transform. So this ball is now synced uh, across clients from the server and it's moved only on the server, okay? And then we have the uh, racket themselves. So the racket uh, has a network transform to sync its position, but it's got client authority, which means that the owner on the, the client owner has permission to move this object, okay? Now, maybe you don't even want that. Maybe you want even more authority, um, sorry, authority, authentication. Maybe you only want the client to tell the server that it wishes to move, then the server should move the paddle. That would be fully authoritative. This game right now is only semi-authoritative. The ball is done by the server, but the clients each handle their own racket. Depending on what kind of game you're making, this is fine, but people could quite easily cheat with um, moving their own paddle. They could, you know, easily write something to just... Um, you know, teleport it wherever they want to. Whereas if the server was moving it, it couldn't, they couldn't do that. Okay. And the player script simply is a network behavior. Okay. So this thing is on all clients, this player, you know, you see the other person's paddle. It has a speed and a rigid body. And then every fixed update frame, only if we are the local player, do we affect the, uh, do we read input and set the velocity. So is the local player returns true if this represents the player on the machine you're on. So effectively, it's just saying, does it belong to me? That's all it's doing, right? If this thing belongs to me, it's the same as photon view dot is mine. If you remember, we have we had a thing called photon uh, photon view dot is mine or something like that, right? If you do that, it's the same as is local player and is local player. The way that the place that comes from is the network behavior. Network behaviors have lots of things on them. One of them is is local player, okay? And that's actually the entire code they use to make this pong game, okay? The game starts, it spawns in the ball, the ball moves, it's synced across the client and the server. There isn't actually, uh, there's no functions that are calling from, oh no, actually, uh, if you see here, the on collision for the ball is, is a server callback, which as you see here, prevents the clients from running this method. So when the ball collides on the client, it just doesn't call this function, right? This only is on the server, only the server tries to do this code. Um, if you tried to do it on the client, it just wouldn't work. It might throw some errors. So this is just to protect it and say, nope, only only call this method if uh, this is on the server, okay? And that's it. Now I've got Pong, okay. That's it for this video, to be honest. We're gonna move into some other topics uh, in the future videos. Let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know down below if you've got any questions. Obviously you can go through and look at the other examples. There's, there's some tanks, one over here, you know. I could spend this video going through all the examples, but it'd be a really long video. So I chose Pong because it'd be quite simple. Um, apparently this is pink because it's missing some texture. I think it's because I, I it's because I changed to using the universal render pipeline. So you'd want to do something about that, maybe fix the materials, but I'm not gonna bother doing that. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know down below, leave a like and subscribe. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you look forward to the new videos on this. Feel free, as I said, to ask any questions down below. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and goodbye. But of course, before I go, I've got to thank my patrons. Special thanks to Jason Swearingen, Liz Kimber, Josh Folsom, Beard or Die, Dustin Miller, Francisco Diaz, Rec, Yoris Letter, Heidi Zorko, Rene, and Marie Baldwin. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to my Patreon is down below. It'd be greatly appreciated if you could go and check out any links to social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord, as well as our website. That'd be greatly appreciated. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.